Hello, I'm Dr. Ian McCullough, and I want to take a couple minutes to talk to you about data science. Now, data science is a, uh, is a term that's widely used. I think the general accepted definition is you are informing decision making with data. Well, from that perspective, if, if you look at the price of gas uh, before you decide which gas station to pull into, you're applying data science. And I don't think that's what we really mean. So I would like to just offer uh, my own opinion on what kind of the essential elements of what data science is when we're, when we're referring to that in probably the consulting space, in uh, government contracting, in the commercial sector. So I think there are three elements to data science. I think the first element is a foundation in probability and statistics. Hopefully what you've learned in this course so far is that understanding some basics about probability, how do we do counting, how do we represent numbers on a number line, what is a distribution function, what's a density, how does that inform our understanding of uh, creating you know, limitations to probability for, you know, limits to probability for, for rare events. How do we then move that into statistical hypothesis testing? How do we do simulation? How do we do regression? Right? All of these things, you know, and regression is basically a model. How, all of these things are based on an understanding of probability and statistics. So yes, while you can go and make a decision as to which gas station you want to go to based on the price of gas, anything more sophisticated than that kind of requires you to understand numbers and understand it not just from the perspective of calculus, but from probability and statistics so you know what the risk of future observations are going to be or you can make inference or you can make models or you can you can do things to kind of have a better understanding of the impact of your decisions with data. So I would say the first requirement for uh, data science is probability and statistics. The second criteria uh, that I would argue goes into data science is coding or maybe you call it scripting um, Maybe you call it uh, programming. And what I would argue is that what's most common is R and Python. Uh, now R is a statistical computing language, so you'll probably find that there's more available packages for more sophisticated things to do in uh, statistics with R. Uh, for example, I, I do social network analysis. If you want to do statistical analysis of networks, at least today as of the recording of, of this video, uh, you really need to do that in R. That's where the packages are. That's where the tools are. Uh, Python has some additional features in terms of uh, web scraping, in terms of, uh, of ways you can manipulate data structures, and so has some advantages as well. Uh, I would also argue that Python is far more common uh, right now, and, and that's the trend that's growing. Uh, but either one, I think once you learn R, you can pick up Python or vice versa. Uh, people tend to like kind of get stuck in that language. Why is that important? Well, it's important to give you the power to actually do something with the probability and statistics and to do something on your own. If you go and buy an expensive statistical programming uh, software license, you have to learn that user interface. Uh, you have to uh, you know, know how to, how to use it to, to conduct whatever tests you're choosing to do so you have less flexibility. Those software licenses are usually cost prohibited for you as an individual practitioner. So maybe if you're working for a company or a university or something like that, you, they have those licenses. Uh, but R and Python are free. And I like to say free is a very good price. Uh, it also is more up to date because as you, uh, as you go and, and somebody comes up with a new method or a new package or a new feature, uh, they're, they're instantly available. So I'll give you an example. Uh, with uh, networks, we can look at a dependent network, right? Here's a social network, and is that a function, statistically, of relationships people have, or demographics people have, or locations they have, right? That, that's called a, we use an exponential random graph model, it's an extension of regression, to do that. Well, there's a new package that came out a couple years ago called uh, Stochastic Temporal a, a, uh, Exponential Random Graph Models. Well, that package, uh, wasn't available in your most advanced uh, statistical software tools. It's a package though that's available in R if you download it to your computer, you can get that today. 
as with all of the other exponential random graph model uh, features and functionality that are not in any uh, professional licensed statistical software that I'm aware of. Okay, so having that ability to code, script, programming in R or Python, I would argue is an important skill set that you need to have as a data scientist. And so the more proficiency you get in one or both, the better. The third component is the science. What is the science in data science, right? It's not just running numbers, right? It's understanding a scientific process for gaining insights. And that's what I'm going to spend the rest of this video talking about. But I just want to make the point that if we agree on these three features, or these three functions, right, it's important that any data scientist has a firm foundation in probability and statistics, they have some proficiency in programming, and they understand methodology. So what methodology uh, should we use to frame these problems? Well, I'm going to give you an acronym. I'm going to give you the road to success, R-O-A-D. What does that mean? Well, that is requirement or research question. Uh, so let's just give you something uh, notional like I'm interested in a understanding how tariffs impact agriculture trade, right? So, uh, um, you know, at, at the time that I'm uh, recording this video, uh, there was a bunch of controversy over uh, Donald Trump's trade war with China and the impact it was going to have on agriculture prices. So he imposed a 10% tariff and he was threatening to increase that tariff to 25%. I'm not being political here, I'm just stating the facts uh, and, and I really don't have any uh, uh, political bias either way. From a data-driven approach, right, we can observe people on both parties, whether you're Republican or Democrat, and supporters of Trump tariffs are going to say, well, yeah, we need to draw a hard line with China because we need to negotiate a better position. There's trade imbalance, et cetera, et cetera. Right? They're all numbers, all being supported. And then the people that are opposing it say, hey, you know, if we look through history, tariffs haven't been good. They've all been bad. Uh, we, we see that you know, uh, farmers are going to be hurting because as the costs go up, the amount of uh, exports to China are going to go down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So um, my point is that uh, when you look at the debate, the debate people are arguing based on opinions and it, there's, there's an assumption. One assumption is that the, uh, that the tariffs are going to increase costs and cost farmers money. The other assumption is that it's going to bring them to negotiations and it's going to have a better impact and that maybe uh, other markets are going to open up and, and create opportunities for these farmers and it's going to be a wash. But neither of those parties have the data. And so if you can identify what is the point of disagreement with two opposing parties? Or what are the two decisions and the trade-offs between them? If you can isolate, well, what is the requirement? What is the research or question that kind of gets at that decision you're trying to make? You have to define that first. That's the first step. That is the research question, okay? Well, it's not clear that I can just go and grab some magical data source and tell you what the tariffs are doing. The next step is I have to operationalize, operationalize with data. There's no perfect data source. There's never a perfect data source. Uh, so what I have to do is I have to make some assumptions as far as what's a valid data. Maybe I go to data.gov, right, and I look at some data. Maybe I, maybe I don't have uh, or, or maybe it's too costly to look at all agriculture trade. So I might just look at soy because uh, soy exports is one of the larger uh, agriculture uh, goods that is then exported to China. Uh, maybe I don't have it at the farmer to farmer level, so maybe I'm going to look at aggregate data across the U.S. Maybe I'm going to just look at California and say, you know, California is close to China. Let me just use California as a proxy for all of America. Now, I'm not making a judgment as to whether that's right or wrong. What you're going to find is regardless of whatever decision you make to operationalize data, if you go and show a person that has position, like 
I don't want to go Republican, Democrat, but there's position A and position B, right? If you go and show somebody that believes in position A, a finding that supports position B, what's the first thing they're going to do? They're going to go right there, and they're going to say that wasn't a good data source. Doesn't matter if it's a good data source. Doesn't matter if they would have agreed to it before. At the point where you're finished with the analysis, they're going to come here and they're going to say, I question your assumptions, just because it doesn't conform to what they preconceived. And that's just human nature. So what I'm saying is, when you define the requirement of the research question, you need to operationalize with the data. And ideally, whoever your client is, you get them to agree that that is, in fact, the research question we should be answering. And that is a viable data source before they ever see a conclusion. Okay. Once you've identified the problem and the data source, now it becomes fairly simple to identify the analysis method. Now, sophisticated doesn't necessarily uh, matter at this point, right? Sometimes uh, visual exploration is perfectly good. Uh, you know, I did a project where um, you know, there, there was an organization that had teams and, and they were uh, basically responding to certain types of events or crises, right? They were like, uh, you know, there would be an incident on a given location in the client site and so the team would have to like get alerted and they'd have to go out there and, and do whatever it is they did to respond to the crisis. So depending on the type of mission, there was a planned uh, level of, uh, of time that that mission was supposed to take. And then of course they would record data on how long it actually took the team to do that. And so um, I simply made a scatter plot of the plan versus the actual, and you would tend to see that that was correlated. But then I looked at the residuals and I highlighted the residuals with red dots. And so you could kind of see, hey, these, these teams were taking two standard deviations more than we expected. These teams were doing it in half the time as expected. And, and that was just simply, the question was, is there any degradation or problems in the teams? We were operationalizing it with planned and actual times because that was fairly easy to ca uh, collect. The analysis method was visual and the decision point was where should the, uh, the, the leader of, of the overall, of all the teams, where should they focus their uh, leader attention, their executive attention? Do they l focus it on maybe uh, teams that are taking longer to perform to say, hey, what was going on in this mission? They could then select the missions, right, and say, Hey, why did this take longer? Did you use a new tool? Uh, was there a personnel turnover? What are the insights? That's where you're more likely to find problems. And the ones that were half the time, that's where you might find successes that you can capitalize and extend to the rest of the organization. So that's an example of a data science driven insight. And there was no advanced statistics. It was very simple visual. But you, know, you might use other things, right? Like uh, maybe you have to do a hypothesis test or regression. Right? That's probably uh, the limit of most people doing uh, you know, basic statistics, but then maybe you get a little more sophisticated and you start doing machine learning, computer vision, natural language processing, graph analytics. And what you'll find in most data science uh, master's programs is there's going to be some sort of foundational course in like probability and statistics and they might introduce you to artificial intelligence or machine learning. They might give you some awareness of, of uh, data engineering or cloud platforms or something like that just so you kind of better understand this step in the scientific process. But beyond that foundation then you're going to see many electives which basically are arming you with different unique analytic methods. right? So an uh, analysis methods. But it doesn't mean that the better the method, or the more, sorry, the more sophisticated the method, the better it is. The best method is the one that most clearly answers the research question with the available data. The last step in our road to success is uh, the decision. Right? What is the decision to be made? Now, usually when I'm working with clients and I start going through this and I get to what decision are you going to make with the data, I get a deer in the headlights look. What do you mean what decision am I going to make? Well, why are we doing this? Why, why do you care about this research question? Uh, hopefully it's to solve a problem, right? If I'm going through this process on this issue of, of tariffs and how they impact trade, hopefully I'm coming down to a decision as to do we go with a 25% tariff? 
Do we hold off on the 25% tariff and keep it at 10%? Do we lift the 10% tariff, right? Those are kind of decisions, and that decision space, we want to define all of this in advance of doing a single thing analytically. We don't want to collect a single data point. I don't want to waste any of my time until that is laid out. Why? We'll find that when you actually pin somebody down on the decision, they might find they have no ability to make a decision. So why are they going to invest in the time and resources to go through this process? Or maybe they haven't fully thought through that decision, and if you identify what the decision is, it might revise what the requirements are. It might revise what data we need to use in order to convince decision makers. And so that is why that road to success is a very important first step before you go at any process. And it follows the scientific process. If you look at the scientific process, it's observe the world around you, right? Form a hypothesis, right? Form a hypothesis. Collect some data, conduct your analysis, and then draw your insights. That's essentially what we're doing with the scientific process. I would, I would argue to just focus that more for data science. If we want to have the science, you need to have your road to success. Now there's one caveat. The road to success is very much focused on decision making, decision support. And I would argue that that is the number one application of what people mean or what they're asking for when they want data science. But there is one other uh, type of data science that I think is worth uh, discussing briefly, and that is reporting. Right? So what is reporting? Well, let's say I'm trying to tackle a problem and I don't really understand what's going on. I don't know what the state of the variables are. I don't know what's happening. Like, I, I have a human resource system. And in the human resource system, uh, the, the, the enterprise resource planning tool that I have uh, is out there. It captures a whole bunch of variables on employees that a variety of companies have found useful, some more than others, right? And so there's a whole bunch of data out there. So I may want to do data visualization of what those variables are. I may want to search for patterns in those variables, right? And that's not, I, I don't have an intended research question. I don't have uh, the set of data sets that I'm looking for, right? I don't know what method analysis. I have no decisions that I'm trying to make. What I'm doing is I'm looking for patterns. I'm looking for, uh, you know, for uh, um, uh, relationships in these sorts of things, uh, and that's reporting, right? I'm just trying to visualize the data so that I can inform a road. But I'm not going to make decisions off of just a random dashboard of, of data points. I'm using that to kind of shape my understanding to be able to plan a road to success. Okay, another uh, value of reporting is going to be uh, th there's you know mandatory oversight. So like in federal government, for example, uh, when Congress uh, sends out uh, funding for uh, for various programs, uh, they have an oversight where they where those agencies then have to report data back to Congress. And maybe that data is not necessary to inform the head of that agency on any decisions they're making on benefits to citizens or you know, how they help people in, in the country, but they do have to report how they're spending the money back to Congress, right? And so that's kind of informing some leadership even if there's no decision involved. And then, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't particularly like this, but sometimes uh, clients are looking at reporting because they want to write a report card that says how awesome they are to their boss, and that's another use of data science that may be more common than not in many applications. Okay, so uh, just to recap, when we're looking at data science, right, we have a foundation of probability and statistics. We understand some programming. We apply science. What do I mean by science? Really, the science is the road to success. You're able to identify a requirement, operationalize with data, select a method of analysis that's appropriate, define what that decision is. You implement that road to success in the planning phase before you collect a single data point do a single method of analysis, and you're using it to drive decision support. That's really what data science is. But you can use these same tools to answer reporting, which is a common ask of data scientists. Thank you for listening.